large corporations and then the, the smaller players on the ground actually can reinforce each other, right? That, Absolutely. That, that you, can, you can really help be a spur to ground up, bottom up entrepreneurship. And that, that's probably a big part of making this happen <clears throat> as we look forward with the SDGs. But that, as you also say, it's not, the, these aren't silos in the sense that it's just the business agenda or it's the government agenda or the civil society and NGO agenda. <laughs> They're joined together, right? That yep. In order for this to really work, they need to be joined together, which really brings us to, to Sam, I think, to get your perspective on how, has the, how have things shifted, let's say, from the MDG era, the role that civil society and NGOs would have played back then versus how it's, you know, as you look forward over the next 15, how, how is it changing? Good. And first, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm from Interaction. We're the largest uh, coalition of U.S. NGOs. Uh, is brand names, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Care, Save the Children. Uh, what's interesting about the U.S. nonprofit sector working internationally is collectively our private resources actually make us the sixth largest donor in the world. So we have an accountability and responsibility yeah. for that. But I think that the change here, we're, we're talking about new goals. Uh, and the last set of goals, just to give them credit, have provided a degree of focus. They've been an organizing principle. They've allowed coalitions and alliances to get together. And they've had some pretty sharp targets, which have allowed us to actually move uh, indicators uh, across different governments and so forth. But that's the what we're trying to do. And I think the new set of what is going to be more complex, more broad. Uh, more inclusive of a broader uh, environmental agenda, uh, more inclusive of issues of uh, sort of collective rights. But, but ultimately what we're talking about here today with the role of business is how is this going to happen, the how of development. And that is the fundamental shift that we're seeing, a shift from the idea that governments, as much as they have an accountability and responsibility for these goals, are able to deliver it by themselves to a sense that this is really only through a multi-stakeholder effort that humanity is going to be able to advance these goals. So this concept of development spreading from the private sector uh, to government and civil society as actors uh, in their own right as part of the development process is a critical evolution <coughs> that we're seeing. Uh, President Obama gave an important speech yesterday on the role of civil society, and he talked about the fact that citizen, all social change ultimately has come from a base of citizens, of citizen engagement. Um, and what I'd like to stress here today is that there is a tendency of, well, it's, you know, government's accountable, civil society critique government. Business is doing its own thing, civil society critiques business. Well, that's one mode of operating. Another mode which we're involving into is interesting partnerships between all three actors, finding ways that upfront business and civil society can be engaged in providing uh, in, in a shared value concept coming from different end goals. Business wanting to make profit, civil society wanting to have a social impact, uh, in fact, we're finding from U.S. NGOs increasingly the uh, CEO is asking the question, are you involved, are you interested in making a profit on this? And if there's sort of a hesitance on the side of business, so, so well, if you're not, we don't think you're serious about your engagement. We okay. want a serious business engagement in this. And the challenge then is what aspect of, of business intervention is actually advancing these goals? And that is where you get this concept of both profit, but profit for a social purpose. And that is where nonprofits or civil society can play a role. Not necessarily at the end of should you have done this differently, differently or acted differently, but at the beginning of a design of an effort that includes a social perspective uh, and helps business with the, the triangle in this multi-stakeholder environment between government, citizens, uh, and their own desire to have a profit. It's a more complex universe, but ultimately it is the only way that we're going to see uh, the reduction of poverty that we want to see and the degree of social inclusion that we want to see under the new goals. And so Sam, in, in, the, in the civil society space and NGOs, you know, they they have their own, pro, you know, mm -hmm. own issues around short term. Mm -hmm. I suppose the grant cycle or mm -hmm. what have you. But how, how do you see that changing? And as as we kind of move into the next fifteen years, I mean, what what's interesting is when you look to the long term, the the 
interests, the common interests or overlapping of interests between civil society and business is tremendous. We all want sustainable growth. Uh, we all want uh, more inclusive growth. Uh, we all want an enabling environment where there are rules of law and degrees of transparency with government. I think the challenge is translating this, these concepts into the the day-to-day -day work, and I think from a sort of U.S. NGO perspective, not so sorry, writ large, I think our challenge is, you know, we'll do a project and you'll impact 200,000 lives, and you'll say that's great. And let's say you're Heifer International and you're working in livestock and milk and you get things going, all right, you've helped ultimately a million smallholder farmers as Heifer. Well, that's very good but that's not going to have the impact that we need to have. And so in their case, they're trying to add a zero to that. And as they then look to value chains to linking that, all of a sudden you find a US nonprofit associated with 17% of the milk market in Kenya. Um, or in the case using the microfinance example, microfinance coming from civil society as a tool to engage the poor, you know, I remember in my previous job, we were able to reach 100,000 women through microfinance activities, but to reach the hundreds of millions, you need a bank or someone else to take that infrastructure and bring it to another level. So to me, it's the, it's the merging of these two structures uh, and enabling each other to some extent. When you said we didn't have a business in microfinance, well, we had a business in microfinance, we just didn't have any capacity to bring it to scale. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, what we are finding is corporations, to some extent more than governments, interested in the long-term market and the creation of a market. And what we're interested in is, well, what is the nature of that market? To what extent does it include marginalized populations? To what extent does it have a better environmental sustainability? And so having that perhaps conceptual conversation ultimately then needs to be brought into the short-term projects for that first step of investing in Africa and so forth, recognizing that this is going to be a long-term market. The US NGO community uh, over the next three years will invest $1.5 billion in Africa of private resources. All right? That makes us a significant player compared to what business could do investing in these markets, we're, we're minute. But what we're interested in is can we tie those short-term investments and the need to make a profit to these long-term goals of a more sustainable economy of greater inclusion? And ultimately, can we together push governments on greater transparency, on greater rule of law, and so forth? And this is where I think there's a potential alignment. You'll see that I'm an idealist. I wouldn't be in civil society if I didn't have this idealism. But if we don't have this sense of what we could create, what we're going to find is short-term projects that get a return or NGOs helping 200,000 people. And the impact over time is we will not have contributed to the building of societies, including our own, that is more inclusive and a bigger market uh, for business to, to thrive long term. Do you say that's a significant shift in perspective? Because I would say if there, if there was, if someone was going to paint the NGO sector with an with a unfairly broad brush in the past, it would have been NGOs great, but you know, they're really, they want to stay small, right? They're really not interested in scaling. And what you're articulating is a complete, that's a completely different perspective. It's, it's really saying how do we become part of the scaling process? And again, I'm talking about the large international NGOs that are yeah. our members. So you know, we can't talk about civil society at large. But if yeah. you're you know, one of our large members, World Vision, you have 53,000 staff around the world in 190 countries. Um, you are a yeah. multinational nonprofit. Right. Um, and you know, when I talk to you know, my friend Helen Gale Kerr or whomever, they are interested in, yes, having their impact for their projects, but we want to leverage and be leveraged. And then in return, it's to what extent are, are key social indicators being met in the projects? Yeah. To what extent are we able to help a standard charter or yeah. uh, you know, a GSK uh, advance their own sustainability goals while recognizing that they're wrestling with how to do that 
uh, within a difficult, complex world, and recognizing from an NGO perspective that contributing to shared value approaches of corporations is going to be a long journey. And this gets back to a word you mentioned, which is trust, yes. and that building of trust between sectors, including government <clears throat> as providing a frame, is ultimately what we're going to need to do to move this agenda forward. And would you say there's a parallel? You know, we were talking about multinationals also linking up with smaller entrepreneurial firms. You see inter the, the multinational NGOs also linking up with the local NGOs and, and engaging them in that process. I, mean, I think the reality, there's been a relationship there going decades. Yeah. And, and the shift is really that the center of voice of force is actually increasingly local. Yeah. Um, and the challenge here is while a multinational or sort of US NGO is increasingly comfortable partnering with business and so forth and with government and trying to find a way to design concepts of shared value where we could add value in that, at the local level it's trickier because you get civil society feeling excluded, uh, you get have government not in essence that comfortable with business. So I think this translation is more, is, is more difficult uh, depending on the governance uh, on the ground. Um, yeah. Some yeah. governance are, are much more open and we find this somewhat in Ghana, you know, working with business, working with civil society. Others are saying, let's control both sectors um, yeah. and ultimately we don't think that's either good for business and it's not really good, certainly not good for citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me start where this is not going to work. Uh, the challenge is that half of the world's poor live in, in fragile or failing states, uh, where you've got poor governance uh, and so forth. The challenge there, uh, with, and this gets to the, the role of government, without effective governance and a framework, uh, you may have business coming in, making a profit, sort of extracting, so forth. You're not, and you'll have civil society critiquing, but you're not going to have uh, positive change. Um, where it will work is if you take these new sustainable development goals, and a government establishes its own vision of what it wants to do in its own country with those goals. It gives a framework, and then within that framework, you could get business, yeah. civil society uh, working within that. So there is this key sort of uh, role for uh, 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 responsible actors within a framework of government. Um, I mean, the reality, there will be, I think, you know, an example would be the extractive industry. Uh, there will, you know, it's hard to mine anywhere in the world without someone Googling where you're mining and digging a hole. You can't dig a hole anywhere without someone seeing it. That doesn't mean that there aren't, uh, you know, irresponsible companies simply digging a hole and getting, uh, you know, having a very negative reaction of societies and so forth. That said, you know, Oxfam working with uh, a significant part of the mining industry uh, are very much on how do you have a more uh, engaged, responsible, uh, extractive industry uh, that is uh, there for the long term. So I think this, it is not, to me, it's not sort of black, white, but there's this long sort of gray area of how uh, do we work within a government program, how good is that government at creating a, a framework within which everyone should work, to what extent uh, are businesses participating within that framework as they make uh, resources, and to what extent is civil society able then to partner with business to create that thing. We've been talking about the positive element when this all lines up. Right. Unfortunately, in fragile states is the area where we're gonna have the toughest uh, yeah. time doing this, and both will exist uh, over the next 15 Distinct years. Distinct failed states, right? Failed so, states, yeah. yeah. yeah right. But that to some degree, if this works, then you, and you have this sort of bottom-up entrepreneurship right. that we're talking about, right. that, that's a, an important positive right. force for better governance. Right. Yeah. 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 And you get the you know, yeah. fastest growing you know, countries yeah. in the world are in Africa, you get this, and then you go to South Sudan and you go, oops, okay, yeah. uh, there isn't the movement there. So I think we're yeah. seeing forces in both directions, but ultimately uh, there's more the sense that someone has a potential for a job, that they have a voice in their society, the more stable societies exactly. are going to be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that is our long-term hope. How are we going to, everyone here, look beyond the triangle of civil society, business, and government, and work together to um, fund and support those businesses that are really about, uh, you know, social good first? Great, thank you. So, first question. Um, 
So this gets to the question of, of are we going to lose five years and uh, uh, to a hot extent you get a momentum. Uh, I'm, the good thing about this set of SDGs is as they follow on the MDGs, uh, there is the momentum of associated with the Millennium Development Goals that is going to continue. Um, it has created coalitions. Those coalitions will continue. Uh, new coalitions will form around new goals. Um, but ultimately, I bring this back to uh, Philips and, and your business model as you've looked to uh, reduce the carbon footprint of lighting and the change your approach to lighting in the world as a company. Um, uh, that momentum that you're creating is going to continue for the next 15 years. I think the, the challenge is, and this gets to the concept of duplication and so forth, is the degree to which uh, business and civil society organize themselves around these new goals. Uh, and the heart of that, in my mind, is issues of transparency. We, uh, we have, through NGO Aid Map, we're mapping the entire footprint of the US NGO community, every single NGO project in the world. Uh, the idea here being that if you know what all the NGOs are doing, if you know what Philips is doing in terms of its efforts of a more sustainable lighting structure and, and then go across multiple businesses, coalitions will form that are associated uh, with the different goals. Um, and that complemented with a framework from government is where we're going to get to the energy to move this forward.